the one that got me teaching in this church. I don't know how she found out everything in the world about me, but I was I wrote a textbook. I wrote a book on Indian culture, and they used it at Bakersfield College for a textbook. And she was telling all about how smart I was in Greek and Hebrew and, and all of that. And anyway, they had me a guest speaker in some of the Sunday school classes. And before it was all over, I was teaching in four and five Sunday school classes every Sunday morning. <laughs> Just one after the other. <laughs> and then, uh, as you know, I've been here for a long, long time. But Donna means a whole lot to me. And hopefully, I, if I live that long, I'll get to see her. Brother Dick, you had a question for me last week. Do you remember what it was? Yeah. What was it? I don't know if it was a question. You had a question. It said, I can't find anything in the Bible about the high priest having a rope tied around his leg or his waist to pull him out of the Holy of Holies in case God killed him because he had sin. Okay. Well, the legend of the rope around the, the, the leg came from the Kabbalah. And the Zohar, the book of the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah which is a, a mystical Jewish book. Okay, it's got some good stuff in there, but some wild stuff sometimes. And the book of Zohar. But if you go to the uh, the book of uh, Leviticus, now this is when I was I used to take classes on the tabernacle, and. Uh, now, if I can remember, Fred Creel was one of my teachers. And I went all over the Middle East with the other one, and I can't remember his name right now. He was one that was really uh, Ernest Crawford. And uh, the tabernacle, what we're talking about, them going in here, and he used to be a real expert on the tabernacle, and Fred Creel was a real expert on the temple, the temples, period. So we're going to look at this. Basically, if you try to find it in the Bible, you're not going to really find it, putting it around his ankle or his leg. Uh, that, would, that came from the Kabbalah and the book of Zohar. Okay? But now go to uh, Leviticus. If I can find my glasses now where I can read. The book of Leviticus, the 16th chapter. Leviticus, is, that's in the Bible. It is, really, Leviticus. Okay. <laughs> All right. In the 16th chapter, the beginning of it there, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron that had approached in the presence of the Lord and died. Okay? It's talking about Aaron's two sons being killed in the tabernacle. And uh, anyway, so that's the subject here, Okay. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron, and they shall not enter at any time in the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. And I will appeal in the cloud over the mercy seat. Verse number 3. And Aaron shall enter the holy place with this and with the bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy tunic, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with a linen sash. Now that linen sash is also a linen rope. There's your rope around the waist. That's the only thing that we have was talking about the rope around the waist. Now the book of Zohar and the Kabbalah tell what they did, what the traditions were about this. Okay? And uh, he's attired with a linen turban. These are holy garments and they shall bathe his body in water and put them on. And what the other books say about the tradition here is they left the linen rope on him and they pulled him out because we had somebody got, two boys got killed before this, okay? And then in the Exodus, the uh, 28th chapter, Exodus chapter 28, verse number 35. Now, a lot of commentaries and people will say, that there was no rope around the waist or no rope around the ankles at all. The rope around the ankle is definitely op, uh, op, uh, optional. It has no biblical reference to that at all, but the rope around the waist does. All right. If the high priest went in there into the Holy of Holies and died, and these two boys, these two priests, that Aaron's sons, they died. 
okay? And this was instituted right after that period of time, okay? Now let's look at verse number 30, well, 31. And you shall make a robe of ephod of all blue, and there shall be an opening at the top and the middle, and around in its opening there shall be a binding woven work, and as it were the opening of a coat of mail, and, it will, and it, that it may not be torn. Verse number 33, And you shall make on its hem pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material, and all around its hem bells of gold between, all, between them and all around. A golden bell and pomegranate, golden bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers and his tinkling may be heard when he enters in and leaves the holy place before the Lord that he may not die. Now, first of all, how far are you going to hear these little bells ring? Huh? Not very far. Who are, who's going to hear it? The other priest. When he goes into the holy place with these bells tinkling. First of all, and then when he goes there, when he walks and, and when, he, when he enters and when he's leaves, that's when the bells are going to ring the most, aren't they? Now, when he's standing in there, have you ever heard, saw a Jew stand still? What do they do? <coughs> they start rocking. So the bells are probably going to be even ringing when he's standing there rocking, ministering, okay? Because before they, if you've ever been to the Wailing Wall or, or see them do whatever, even their prayers are rocking all the time, okay? So probably the bells were ringing, but only those. You could not hear the bells outside of the tabernacle area, okay? Now, did that do you any good? Okay? That answer your question. <laughs> anyway, there, there that is. But anyway, that's what it was. So the people in the immediate vicinity of the priest that was going in there could hear the bells ring. There was probably a rope. We know there was a rope tied around his waist. It's called a limited sash or rope around his waist. Okay? We don't have an incident of it tied around his foot at all. But what had happened there in Leviticus, the first part of the 16th chapter of Leviticus, Aaron's two sons were killed. And so they were trying to figure out what to do about a priest if he dies. So that's what it's talking about. That's it. All right. Any other questions about that? Are you interested in that at all? That was Old Testament stuff, you know. Now let's go to the New Testament. Now, last week I handed out a handout to you and uh, Randy I have a new improved version of this okay. last week I could not I was afraid to lose it on my computer how many of you ever lost anything on your computer <laughs> <laughs> you have to realize that I did about 70 hours of work on this lesson and I was really sweating bullets in front of my computer afraid that I was going to lose this chart because I really wanted to keep this chart because this is the best exp explanation of uh, Calvinism that I ever had and, you know, that I ever worked on. Trying to get it down to where people could visually see what it's talking about. All right? And so, and your wife doesn't have one of these, does she? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, no. this lady. Well, I've got them. Well, i got both those charts there. Now... <clears throat> Go over to the chart real quick before we get into our lesson, all right? Because this I did a lot of work on. And uh, the new improved one, someplace. I even wrote down what I believe. Uh, down below that, you don't have that. People ask me, what do you believe? I say, well, I'm classified as a Calvinist, whether I like it or not. You're either two groups of theologically in the world. What are they? Armenian and Calvinism, one or the other. Now, we're only discussing Calvinism here. Armenians have all different kind of levels of Armenians also. They all believe in from uh, being able to lose your salvation some way, that there's something you have to do to keep safe, simply. That's our meaning, okay? And your Calvinist, uh, I finally got the chart right, see that? I had this uh, infralapsarian over on the wrong side, and I tried to explain it before, but now I got it straightened out, okay? 
Now, Calvinism basically believes that God in eternity past ordered the elect to be saved. Okay? And there's all different kind of views of that. And I am a modified sublapsarian. I want to tell you that. A modified sublapsarian. Now, let's look at this for just a moment. We'll cover this. See, you weren't here when we did this, were you, young lady? At all. Okay? Uh, Brandy, I know that you're very much in, uh, interested in this. Now, this last chart I did is much better than the other one, but, but I, what I did is I ripped it off and pasted it and copied it in another place, just in case I lost it. Because if I lost it, there went all those hours of work to make this little blue and stuff. I took this thing and I stretched it out and I did all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I, I, I got them where I split it up. I couldn't even divide the last one, remember. It was all in one piece. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that. And uh, I couldn't divide the limited atonement either before, so I had to kind of explain things. But now I, I think I got it straightened out, and I think this is the best explanation of Calvinism that I've ever done. And we are in 665 in the Gospel of John. It's talking about, this is one of the things for the uh, hyper-Calvinist go. Okay? Now let's look at it. Tulip. You remember what tulip means? Total hereditary depravity. What does you mean in TULIP? Unconditional election. What does L mean? Limited atonement. What does I mean? Irresistible grace. What does P mean? Preservation of the saints. You've got an A++ plus 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 tonight there, Pam. Let's look at it a little bit. Over to the left, we have a decree where it says decree. All right. And we have a T... U-L-I-P over there, all right? That's TULIP, all right? And then we have supralapsarian, antilapsarian, and infralapsarians there. Now, the infralapsarians do not believe that men were created reprobate, okay? They do not believe that men were created reprobate. Your supralapsarianism and your anti, or, or your antilapsarians believe that in eternity past, God divided, or God decided who He would create. And right here it says, right there in the blue, on the left-hand column, that's to save some and condemn or reprobate others. All men are spiritually dead, but only the elect have the ability to respond to God's call. Okay? Now that's antilapsarian or supralapsarian. Your infralapsarians do not believe that point. Now, I believe in total hereditary depravity. I think we all should do that. But if a person is so dead that they cannot believe, that's different. Okay? Now, look over to the right. Your sublapsarian and your postlapsarian views. All men are depraved and all men are given, but all men are given the ability to respond to grace. That's what a sublapsarian believes. Okay? Now let's go back to the left again, under you. All right? Uh, this group believes that God created the elect and the reprobate. The rest, the rest not on any meritous quality of the elect, but by grace only. Now we know, unconditional election, that God did not pick us out because we were better than others. Men are men. We're all Adam's children, and we're all sinners. Okay? We know that God wrote people's names in the Lamb's Book of Life when? Before He ever created anything. That's fact. And uh, the sublapsarians and the modified sublapsarians like me believe that God did this by His foreknowledge. Okay? And your superlapsarians, your antilapsarians, and your infralapsarians believe that God did this by decree, and that's just the way they were going to be. They were going to be created reprobate. There's a lot of difference in that, okay? Number three, L. Or go back over there. Go back to the sublapsarian, postlapsarian. 
create human beings and call the elect and those who are reprobate on equal callings. Now God says that he's not what? Willing that any should perish, any. Now your super lapsarians will say that only the any are the elect. <laughs> okay. They always have to twist that up and try to make it mean the elect. All right. Number three, the decree and L, to authorize the fall. God did God allow Adam to fall? Hmm? Did he? Did, yeah, he did, didn't he? Did he allow the angels to fall? Did he allow the spirits to fall? Yeah, there's a difference between angelic orders and spiritual order. Spirits and angels are not the same animal. Okay? They're different species of beings. Angels have form. Angels and spirits go from one dimension to the other. We are in one dimension here. We live in this physical dimension. All right? God allowed them all to fall. When God created the... the uh, the earth, originally Satan was over it. And Satan tried to tear the whole place up, which he did, but God restored it in Genesis, the first chapter. Now God authorized the fall. And if you are a superlapsarian, antilapsarian, or infralapsarian, all three of these teach that the reprobate are not called and do not have the ability to respond to God's grace. The atonement is limited only to the elect. Now run over there to the right, the right side. The decree to create human beings and give the ability to respond to God's call to all men. The atonement is sufficient. This is very important. The atonement, when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, the atonement was sufficient to save what? All men. What verse, do, what scripture do we usually use for that? First John 2 and 2. He died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Okay? Now, there are a lot more than that. All right. Now, the sub, sub-lapsarians and post-lapsarians create human beings and give the ability to respond to God's call to all men. The atonement is sufficient to save all mankind, but is efficacious only to who? The elect. God's not going to save anybody if you don't believe. Your Unitarian, Universalist, and all that, they will believe that God is not going to allow anybody to go to hell in the end, that Jesus Christ's atonement covers all men, regardless of what they believe or act or how they act, period. Okay? Go back to the left again where it says I. Now, sopralapsarians, antilapsarians, and infralapsarians believe that the decree to call only elect by irresistible force of grace going beyond any personal ability to respond to the grace of God. Now, you superlapsarians do not send out missionaries. Why? <coughs> Why, Brother Dick? Because everybody's predetermined. The, 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 the elect are going to get there. You can't stop them from coming because they are the elect. So you don't have to send out a missionary to get these people to come. Because I don't care where you are, if they're marked, God's going to drag them right over there and they're going to believe. Period. That's what the superlapsarians believe. Now, who in the world is the superlapsarians? In history, who, were, who was a superlapsarian? Who believed this? Aha. Uh -huh. Who was it? A.W. Pink was one. Yeah. What are the modern Baptists that believe this today, that will not send out a missionary? They will not preach an evangelistic message at all. They are called primitive Baptists. All right? The primitive Baptists. The superlapsarian, antilapsarians, infralapsarians, they, they believe that God decreed to call the, only the elect by, by an irresistible force of grace going beyond any personal ability to respond to the grace of God. The sub-lapsarian and post-lapsarians believe that, that God's decree to save some and condemn others if you hold to an unlimited atonement but believes in irresistible grace. Okay. That I was going to erase out of there. Did you, is your saved believes in an irresistible grace? Yes. Well, my computer did not mind. <laughs> okay, it doesn't believe in the sub-lapsarians 
Uh, yes, the sublap. Yes, the sublapsarians do believe in ir irresistible grace. Actually, now I'll go down to P. They do believe in irresistible grace. That's the point that I was going to pull out on mine. What I believe, the modified sublapsarian. Number five, the fifth point of Calvinism, <coughs> provides salvation only for the elect with a guarantee of eternal salvation, not based upon works, but upon grace only for the elect, basically. Now the sublapsarians provide eternal salvation for all, but the atonement is efficacious only to the elect. All right? They still differ. The sublapsarians differ from the supralapsarians and the infralapsarians in that way. Now, my little announcement of what I believe, okay? <laughs> and how many of you don't have that? Some of you don't. Okay. I ran out of paper and ink. I ran out of paper and ink. All right. Yeah. Can you, do you have? I, it might be on the next page over there. Is it, is it over there at the top of the next page? Okay, in your, if you don't have that chart, it's on the top of the next page. All right. And I wrote this in the third person, okay? Okay. On the next page, the third page, I tried to write it down on this other thing because I was going to make those handouts where I could hand them out if I'm ever teaching on this subject again. I hope this helps you a little bit. All right. The author is, mo is a modified sublapsarian believing in one, total hereditary depravity, but providing the for the ability to respond to grace by all men. Okay? I believe in unconditional election. God does not elect us because of who we are. Number three, I believe in, I believe in unlimited atonement. The atonement of Jesus Christ covers the sins of all mankind only, but it is efficacious to the elect. The author totally rejects the doc doctrine of irresistible grace, and this hyper-Calvinist will say, well, nobody that is saved ever resisted the grace of God successfully. That's true. <laughs> okay? And I definitely believe, the author truly believes in preservation of the saints and total security of eternal salvation for true believers in Christ. That's my point of view. So you got it down in writing. All right? Do you have any questions on this before we get into 666? Chapter 6 and verse number 66. You have any questions? Young man, the young lady, do you have any questions on that? I, I hope this didn't. It doesn't spell two of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I've been teaching that for a long, long time. Hardly anybody ever teaches it. 665, and that's where we started. Kai, Elegan, Diatuto, Ereka, Himen, Hote, Udes, Dinate, El Thane, Pros, Me, Eon, Me, A, Didomenon, Altu, Ek, Tu, Patros. And he kept on saying, therefore, or because of this. All right. Dia Tuto, it means because of this or through this. I have told you. That's in the perfect tense. I have told ye that. No one, he is caused to be able to have the power to come to me except that he may be. And look at that. Always when it talked about somebody coming to God, it's either in the middle voice or in the indicative mode. Why? The volatative qualities of election. <laughs> volatative means there is personal volition. Always. Period. It's in, in Hebrew and in Greek, it is the same thing. All right? Third person singular present, subjunctive active, because he may or he may not. Having been given to him out of the Father, out of the Father's hands. Now let's go to 666. Ek tu un poloi, ek ton, mathaton, altu, apelthon, ace, ta, O piso, kai, ukete, met, altu, peri, patun. Yeah. 
The therefore out from among out. That's what it literally says. Of the disciples of him. There were a few out of the disciples of him. That's what it literally means. There were a few out of the disciples of him. Dakota? Dakota. Are you there? Have you got the hiccups again? No. I was going to have you come up here and say something. It scared the hiccups out of you. <laughs> That a mathetes. Now, what does a mathetes mean? Remember what mathetes means? Brother Mike? I guess habitual learner. Habitual learner. Thank you very much. Habitual learners. That's what I like. Are you too warm in here? Because no. we can turn the air conditioner on a little bit. You're sweating, Brother Mike. Hold on just a minute. Get off the camera long enough to do this. While you're not speaking, Brother Jim, I wanted to tell you that the earth word processing program will save everything every minute, two minutes, or three minutes if you just go into it and set it. Yeah, but I'm not smart enough to do that. <laughs> now, see, I'm a Stone Age, Stone Stone Age man, what do you call a... <laughs> need I need somebody to teach me how to do all that stuff. I did this, but boy, I was really sweating when I did it. All right. There were some out of the, the many, therefore, out of the disciples of him. They went away. Look at that way. Apelthon. Apo, that's what the first part of that means. Is it comes from Apo and Erkamai. All right. They came away. They left. Some of the disciples left. And they uh, backed off. Literally what it says, they backed off. This was too hard of a saying for them, what he said. Too hard of a saying. Now, he had said some pretty strong stuff here, didn't he? No longer with him, they kept on walking as a habit. They didn't keep on walking with him as a habit, all right? What, would, what really tore them up? What did Jesus say that really blew their minds? What was it? You remember? He said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot get to go to heaven or any of this. That's it. And they, some of them just said, is this guy a cannibal? How are we going to eat him and drink his blood? And besides that, you're not supposed to drink blood. That's what the Bible says. The life is in the blood. All right. Eternal life was in his blood. All right. And, of course, now we have the Lord's Supper that reminds us of that. And even back then in that area in the Old Testament time in the tabernacle the blood of all the atonements was whose? Who did it typify? Christ's blood. And, the, and this little area in the, temp, in the tabernacle right here in the holy place, what does that typify in the, in the, in the world today? What's it a type of in the world today? We know Primarily, it was a type of Christ. Everything was. But secondarily, what is the type of the holy place today? Brother Mike, you remember? Heaven. No. The holy place is where the Spirit dwells. Okay. The now in, in, in no, no, that we're talking about the Comforter now. Okay. okay. What is the holy? What is the holy place today? Right before you get there is a baptismal font. First of all, when you get in Christ, the only way you can come is by sacrifice. First thing you come to here is what? The labor, which typifies baptism before church membership. Uh -huh. Then you walk in here and there's light in that room that has no light in it. And there's a table of showbread over here and there's an altar of incense in here. What does that typify in the world today? Ecclesia. That's the ecclesia, the church in the world today. If you want to get really serious about worshiping God, do it in church. That's where that's where you're going to get the leadership. You don't go out and run around on your own. The church is the administrator of God's kingdom in the world today. All right? And in the church, we have two ordinances, which are what? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And only the priests were legal to eat this table of showbread, that presence bread. All right? And the Lord said, we're what? We're all priests. No. 
okay, today. See all of that types back then goes to first of all Christ and then secondarily to the church. The, the Holy of Holies there is a type of heaven itself, of course, where the Ark of the Covenant is. 667 now. A pain, un, hoesus, tois, didokin, me, kai, himes, thelete, hippagain. And he said, therefore, to Jesus, to the ones, twelve, to the twelve. He's speaking now to the apostles. What does the word apostle mean? Apostle, what does it mean? Apostello. That's where it comes from, two Greek words, apo. We looked at apo a while ago. What does that mean from? What does that mean? That means away from. And then stello. What does that mean? It means to send. But the word apostello means to be sent on a king's mission. An apostle in the Greek language meant some emissary of the king. Somebody with a lot of authority. Like a general or something. Okay? To carry out orders. That's what apostello means. That's what we get the word apostle. Now the apostles those that had special power and authority from Jesus. Okay? Not also ye, ye wish to go. Look at that one. Second person, plural, present, indicative, active, to go. Are you going to leave? Are you going to go under? That's literally what it means down there. Uh, to go means to go under. Are you going to go under too? All these have gone under now. Are you going to go under also? All right. 6 and verse 68. Apocrithae. Alto Simon Petros, Curie, Pros Tina, Apalusometha, Remata, Zoes, Eonion, Echais. All right. And uh, Simon Peter. Simon means what? That's what kind of word is that, by the way? What kind of word, Simon? That's Hebrew word. What is it? In the, what name in the Old Testament really? Simon shouldn't be used here. What should be used here? What's the name that should be used? Huh? Simeon. Simeon means what? One who hears. One who hears. And how about Petros? That's a Greek word. What does Petros? Petros? That's the word Petros right there. All right. That ending means a whole lot. All right. That ending means a whole lot. Turn to Matthew 16, 18 also. You can't do this without looking at that. Because we're talking about the same subject, the same period of time, everything else. Have to go back and look at this all the time. It's very important. <coughs> This is the same event at the same period of time. John records it differently than Matthew. What are the three synoptics in the Bible? The three synoptics. What are they? Who can name them? Brother Dick? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Is that what you were going to say too? Well, both of you are right. So you both get A pluses. All right. And what does synoptic mean? It comes from two Greek words. Seen. That's a preposition. What does that mean? With or together. All right. With or together. All right. And then, how many of you got an ophthalmologist? Okay. Ophthalmologist. Ophthalmos. It literally means to see together. We have three Gospels that see together. And then we have one Gospel that is totally different. And what Gospel is that? The Gospel of John. Why did John write the Gospel of John? We have three witnesses, and the Bible says, by two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Why did John write the fourth Gospel? He wasn't going to. It's the last Gospel written. 
All the other ones are written. Most of the people are dead when John wrote this gospel. Did you know that? Most of the people are already dead that were the actors. Peter and all of them, Paul, uh, they're all dead. They're all gone. They've all been killed and martyred, okay, by this time. Now, uh, why did he write this gospel? Remember? Young lady? To emphasize the divinity of Christ. They emphasize that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God. That's who he is. And John 1 and 1 is not a Greek idiom. It is a Hebrew idiom. How should John 1 and 1 be translated? <coughs> in beginning, singular. Third person singular and perfect indicative actually is in archaean o logos. That's what it says in Greek. In beginning, singular beginning, the absolute eternity past. No further back there you can see at all. In eternity past, period. He kept on being the Word. But what is that the Word there, Brother Roger? The Logos. The Logos. What is it? How should it be translated? Jehovah. Jehovah. Because John is not using a Greek idea, the Logos, that means the original idea of God. But he's using the Greek, the Hebrew idiom, which is Ha the Bar, or Ha Shem, or Adonai today, which it means the Jehovah. In the beginning, kept on being the Jehovah. The Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead because he kept on being God. John 1, 14, Kylo goes, Sarks again, and the word or the Jehovah flesh he became. That's what John wants us to understand. And every few chapters, he throws that at us again. Okay? Now here we have and he answered him, Simon Peter, Lord, Lord, Kyrie. All right. How would you say that in Hebrew, brother? Uh, Adonai. Adonai. The Jews, when they come to the name Jehovah today, they say what? They won't say Jehovah because we don't know how to say it anyway. That's a joke. We don't know how to say the word Jehovah. It's the word, Hadavar. They say what? Adonai. Right here. Who shall we go to, Jehovah? <laughs> Who shall we go to? For to whom shall we go? And look at this now. I talked about the volatative qualities and character of election, didn't I, last week? What's it say here? What, what voice is this in? Who shall each of us go to? First person, plural, future, indicative mode, that's a statement of fact. And what voice is that, Brother Roger? Middle voice. M-I-D means middle voice. Middle voice means you do it for yourself. We do have the ability to come and go, don't we? Tonight, the class tonight, basically the title of this class tonight is the volatility of, of um, qualities and character of discipleship. The volatility qualities and character of discipleship because we're going to see it again. There is volition in what we do. Always volition. To whom or toward whom shall we go for ourselves? Words of life eternal you keep on possessing. Words of life eternal you keep on possessing. Now look at that word remata. Now that's not the word logo, is it? Or logos. It's what is the other word for, uh, for word in Greek? What? Laleo. Laleo. All right? It's not logos. It's not leo, but it comes from rio. This word rio, which means to flow. And what is this talking about? This is an edict. Remember when we studied, we looked at those edicts over here? God decreed or, or his edict was to create. Okay? That's an edict. The decree of life eternal... You have. You possess it. You possess the decrees of eternal life. You possess it. You own it. You are the one that's going to dispense it. All right? 669. The volatile qualities and character of discipleship. We'll see it over and over again. Kai, he may, pepistu, common. Kai, agno, come in. Hote, 
C A Ho Hagios Tuthiu. And we, we have believed, and we have known that you, you keep on being the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God. Are you too cold now? <laughs> All right. You're the Holy One of God. Matthew 16 and verse number... Let's go back to Matthew 16 now because we're talking about the same subject. Let's go back over there. <clears throat> and verse... Uh, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. All right. Matthew 13. Matthew 16 and 13. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? Who do you say that I am? And he said, Some of them say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some Jeremiah, and are one of the other prophets. Verse number 15, And he said unto them, But who do you say that I am? Verse number 16, And Simon Peter, here we have John's very opinion and his idea and what he saw on this day. We get it over in the Gospel of John. And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay? And that's exactly 669. All right? That's exactly what it's talking about, 669. And verse number 17. And he said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, Simeon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Remember what John just said over there? No one can come to the Father except He give Him. Do you understand we're on the same page? We're on the very same page in the life of Christ right here in these two verses. Now let's look at verse number 18 that the world gets wrong. Okay? This is another one of them things, Brother Mike. <clears throat> Not like, like Genesis 1 and 1 and 2. Here's another one that just flabbergasts you when you look at it from Greek as it tells a different story than what the Catholic Church and the Protestant world says. Peter isn't the rock. He's not the rock. Period. All right? <clears throat> but the Father in heaven, verse number 18, And I also say to all of you, all of you, Zoe, and I so say to all of you, Lego, that he says to all of them now, and he said, Peter, he picks out Peter. He said, Peter, you are a little stone, Petros. Not many singular masculine. The masculine gender of Petros means a little small stone that you can pick up and throw. Okay? And then he says in here, now we have Kai, page 208 in your little analytical Greek lexicon. Uh, Brother Sick, you, did you bring that with you tonight? No. Oh, you didn't. Uh, oh, that's what it looks like anyway. On page 208 here. Uh, so your new one, your other one's all beat up. Yeah, it is. I just wanted people to actually see what this one looked like. <laughs> Without being written in and all beat up. The mild one's got leather on everything. Right there on, on page 208. What do you see right there, young lady? Uh, Kai. Kai. And it tells you all about Kai. It is a conjunction. Sometimes it's an adversative conjunction. Sometimes it is a enclitic particle or a particle of affirmation. All these little things. It can mean yes, it can mean but, it's, it can mean and, or it can mean also, or yes, like amen. It can be used just like amen, yes, most affirmatively. Now let's look and see what he says here. How in context would this be used? And I also say, and then he used, it, it's a cago day. Day is a weak adversity conjunctive particle, page 85, if you want to write that one down. To you all... And I say to you, Peter, you, Peter, little stone, but upon this, you, Peter, you are a little stone, but upon this gigantic foundational rock, Petra, but upon this fi gigantic foundational rock, I shall be doming up or building up of me the ecclesia. He didn't build that ecclesia upon Peter. He built it upon himself. Now, what did Peter say about that later on? 
Who did? Who who was the foundation stone? Who Peter say was? Did he say I'm the rock? Who did he say? Christ is the rock. In the Old Testament, every time we talk about Jehovah, it's Jehovah is my rock. The rock in the wilderness that Moses struck with Aaron's rod or God's rod. What did that rock represent? Christ. Simple as that. That's the rock. And it was a great big rock. It wasn't some little stone. It was a great big rock. Okay? I shall be building up the church of me and the gates, the pile, pile, that's gates, the gates of the unseen world shall not be able to wrestle her down. Now, according to most people in church history, the church died in the Dark Ages. Catholicism died. I mean, it became nothing. But do you know that there were true New Testament churches going all the way through that time? through that period of time preaching the truth. They're the ones that kept the Bible. Catholicism was trying to destroy the pages of the Bible that you have today. They were burning everything they could burn. The edicts to burn them. To burn the, burn the Bible. It wasn't legal to have a Bible in Greek at all. That was a common man's language. It, they would only allow people to have Latin Bibles and those people that had them were the priest and the doctors because the Latin was the language of the uh, educated people. I'm going to turn that thing up a little bit. This girl here looks like your priest today. She isn't. I know someone else who is. Oh, you know somebody else. Oh, yeah. All right. We've got to move off of here a little bit. <laughs> they always have to put up with me running away off the camera for a moment. <laughs> All right. The volatile qualities and character of discipleship. And we have believed and we have known that you are the one, the Holy One of God. These are the little elect, aren't they? But one of the elect here was a devil, wasn't he? 670. Apocrite. Altois. Hoesus. Uk. Ego. Himas. Tus. Duodeca. Ex El Zaman. I ex himon, ace diabolos esten. And he answered them, he caught up in speech, it's apocrite, that literally means to from judge. It means to catch up, catch up in speech is literally what that, say, what that says there in Greek. Third person singular, first error, indicative, passive. He was called to catch up and speak with them, uh, catch up in speech with to them, the Jesus. Not I am Ye, not I, you, the twelve, I picked out for myself. Look at that. XL Zalman. First person singular, first heiress, indicative. What voice is that in, Brother Roger? Middle. Middle voice. I picked out for myself. I picked you out. Did Jesus choose the twelve? All of them. He's the one who picked them out. And out of ye, one is a diabolos. What's diabolos mean? Okay, diabolos. Devil, he's a, he's a destroyer. Diabolos means to, uh, to shoot, to shoot up and shoot through. He's a shootist. He's a destroyer. He's a killer. And look at the last word, Eston. That's third person singular, present indicative active. What's present tense mean? What's present tense? Young lady, what present tense is? Brandy, what's present tense? I don't know. All right. What's present tense? Sharon, what's present tense? Well, it's, now he it's right is. now. Yeah. It's going on right now. It's going on right now. Present tense is it's something happening right now. Okay. Present tense. All right. And it is uh, indicative mode. What's the indicative mode? The indicative mode. The the mode is does it tells you how the tense is affirmed. Okay? What's the indicative mode mean? If something is, is indicative, what, am I, what, is it, what is it? It's true. It's a fact. Determined as true. Determined as a fact. All right, now it's active voice. Present, indicative, and active voice. This devil keeps on being a devil. He continues to be a devil. He wants to be a devil. All right? 
Now, if you go back to your superlapsarians now, in eternity past, God chose everyone and they're locked in. But remember, a decree is not an act. A decree is not an act. What does that mean? Sharon. When God decrees it in the foundation of the world. That's but before he ever created over, anything. It has an overall plan. But it's not in effect until the act is actually done. Thank and, you. And we have to... That's our decision. Okay, that's an A++++++. Okay. Remember that little Christmas story, you know, when Ralph got up there and the teacher got up and said, A++++++. Plus 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 plus. There she got an A++++++. Plus 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 plus. Do you know how much trouble that's going to cost? <laughs> <laughs> in eternity past, God said that he was going to send to his son to die on the cross and save mankind. And the Bible says he stood as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. But that was a decree, was it not? When did it take effect? When did it become in effect? In space and time, the act took place and the act validified the plan. Okay? Even though Jesus stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, it didn't take effect until he did it. Did it? No. He had to die on the cross of Calvary. Not figuratively. Not like this is what should have happened, but this is what did happen. Jesus Christ did come into the world. Jehovah became flesh. What does the word Jehovah mean? Jehovah. Let's look at that word. There's the word Jehovah right there. What does that mean? Literally. He who shall become. That's what it means. Jehovah means he who shall become. And it comes from the, the Hebrew root right there. And what does that mean, brother? You can read that. Hayah. See there, he's a, he's a genius in the hiding. <laughs> And on page 224 in Brown, Driver, and Briggs, on page 243 in Kohler and Gardner, you can read that right there. And that means to become. That is the same thing as that little verb that we had down here at the end of verse number 70, estim. That's equivalent to it. Okay? He who shall become, and John 1.14 says, Kaiho Logos Genito, and the word or the Jehovah flesh he became. And the becoming one flesh he became is what it literally says. Isn't that beautiful? Now you take that to Jehovah's Witness and cram it down his throat. Don't let him up for air at all. Don't let him up for air. Period. Get him. Sick him. They can't overcome that because that is the word of God. And God used those words especially for that very, very reason. 6 and verse 71. I picked that one out of you, out for myself, and he kept on wanting to be a devil. Now, God didn't uh, make Judas Issachariot or Judah Issachariot. Judah means what? He had a good name. Praise Jehovah. That's what his name means. What about Issachariot? Issachariot. All right, man from Cariot. All right. That's where his family had come from, Cariot, which was down by Hebrew. Elegane. 671. Elegane. Day. Ton Udon Simonus. Issacariot. Issacariot too. I'm trying to say it in Hebrew instead of Greek. Hutos. Gar. Emelane. Paradidene. Auton. Ace. On. Ek. Tone duodeca. <coughs> and he kept on saying, now he kept on saying the Judas, son of Simon, Issachariot. This one, for he kept on being about. Look at that word. It comes from mellow. See that word right there? M-L-A? He kept on being about. 
Could Judas have been saved? He could have. But God used him and picked him out. And he is the only disciple in the Old Testament that was even prophesied. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? That's the only disciple of Jesus that was prophesied to come into existence. In Psalm 109, 5 through 8, and in Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, it says that he would come about. Okay? This is the one. This is the one that's going to betray him. He's a Judean also. This one he kept on being about. He continued to. God knew what he would do. God knew in the Old Testament before Judas was even ever born what he was like. Canaan. Canaan in the Old Testament. Canaan was who? Who was the first Canaan? Huh? Who was he? Who was this guy? Well, who was the first person named Cain? Huh? Cain. <laughs> What does Cain mean? Young lady? I've gotten an end. I, it means God. All right. And it's very beautiful. In, in Genesis 4 and 1, Eve says, well, the Bible says that God uh, cohabited his wife, had sexual relations with his wife, and she conceived. It literally says she caught together, and she brought forth a son, and she called, and she said, they called his name Cain because she said, we have gotten... Jehovah. She thought Jehovah was born because she believed in Genesis 3.15. God didn't make a promise that through the woman the Messiah would come and she thought her first son was going to be the Messiah and what a mistake that was. <laughs> <coughs> what they saw in, in Cain was the evil, the, the, the deception, the evil, and the dregs of sin that they had committed in their own life. They saw it perfected in this boy and he became the first murderer. There was another boy named Cain, or Canaan. And who was that boy? Where's the next Canaan? The son of the son of Noah. The son of the son of Noah. All right. Noah, <coughs> Noah, after the flood came, Noah planted a vineyard, and the wine, the grape juice that he got from the vineyard was intoxicating and he drank a lot of it and he became very intoxicated and he was laying in his tent and uh, there's most of the rabbis will say this that uh, Ham walked in on his mother and father and he cohabited with his mother and she had a child called Canaan and that child that was his son was cursed all right, And God knew what they would be like. And they became the inhabitants of the land of what? Canaan. And what kind of people were they going to be? Bad. <laughs> Bad people. And God said that he would curse these people and they would be servants of servants. What would happen is that now these people aren't even born yet. Okay, they're not born yet. They haven't come into existence yet. But God, in his foreknowledge, knew what would happen. These people would go into the land of Palestine, which would be called the land of Canaan. They would build farms and, and ranches and vineyards and, and orchards, and they would plant fields and build homes and all of that. And what would happen? They're going to be there for lots of years and they're going to sin and they're going to sin and they're going to sin and they're going to sin. And God says when that sin is fulfilled, when it blossoms, by the way, James said sin does what? When it's fully mature, it brings forth what? Death. Now God told this to Noah. He told this to Noah way back yonder, right after they landed out of that ark. And he said all this is going to happen in the future. This is what we call predestination, foreordination, and all that. This is what we call foreknowledge of God is what it actually is. Way over here. This is right here. He, his, 
to man the responsibility to scatter and multiply and to inhabit the whole known world at that time. They built, Nimrod built a tower, and it was finished, by the way. It's finished. It's built. And, uh, and we're one world religion and a one, one man power. And all of them were supposed to scatter and multiply. They did not do it. God divided the languages, and he did what? He divided the continents. Right here is when God gave that prophecy to Noah. Before the earth was divided, before the languages were anything. And then he also said that for 400 years they're going to be down in Egypt. He told Abraham for 400 years they're going to be down in Egypt before it ever happened. He did it 400 years, he said. And then he says they're going to be in this Egyptian bondage. And they're going to come out of there, and he's going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, and that's Canaan land. That's Canaan land. Those people that would become so bad, they were supposed to go in there, and what were they supposed to do to the Canaanites? Kill them. Because they were vicious, terrible people. We know from the book of Jasher at the Canaanite wars. Remember when, uh, when that whole village of Shechem was converted to Judaism? And then Levi and Simeon went up there and murdered all of them. And Jacob said what? They're going to try to... There are a lot of them and they're going to kill us. And they did. According to the book of Jasher, 10,000 of them congregated around Jacob's family, which was Israel. And they were going to kill them and they went out and wiped them all out. And then they went and started conquering the Canaanite cities. They thinned them out before they ever went into Egypt. They thinned them out a whole lot. And then they went down in Egypt, and then they came back and they thinned them out again. Because God, not because God made them to be bad, but because God knew they would be bad. Were some of the Canaanites saved? Huh? Yes. Those that would believe. So God always leaves a hope out there, doesn't He? He always leaves a hope. In service, there's a volatile quality and character to our service to God. There's a volatile quality and character to election. God doesn't go beyond our will. He gives us volition. He gives us choice in everything that we do. And he gave Judas Issachariot choice. But what did Judas Issachariot do? do? He kept on making the wrong choice. And God said he would keep on making the wrong choice. He kept on being about to betray him. He kept on being about. He kept on doing it on purpose. Wasn't by accident. Wasn't slightly wrong. He was all wrong. Well, next week, we're going to get in the seventh chapter, actually. In the seventh chapter. Do you have any questions? It is very good having you here with us tonight. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? No. <laughs> yeah. We are missionaries to the South Pacific Island of Vanuatu. Okay. You want to come up here and tell us that so they can see you? <coughs> we got people all over the world listening to you. <laughs> it's still on. Everything's still there. We're just we're missionaries to Vanuatu. It's in the South Pacific. Uh, about 300,000 in the, on the islands, and we used to be in West West Africa, Ivory Coast, and but they were overthrown. There was a coup d'etat, mm -hmm. and so after spending 15 years there, we went down, and we've been 10 years in Vanuatu. So Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we support missions in the Solomon Islands. Do you really? Yes. That's great. Jacob Busa was my good friend. Really. Do you know who Jacob Busa was? I don't. But all right. I'll look him up. I'll, look, I'll was, try to learn all I can was, about He was him. one of the most famous heroes in World War II. Really? He was uh, uh, with uh, the raiders that went in there and drove the Japanese out of the islands, and he was tortured and everything yep. and uh, cut to pieces, mm -hmm. and he still rescued his men, and he had to have 19 
bloods of pints of blood given to him, and in two weeks he was back out there being a soldier a, a, again. But with a uh, with the uh, Marines. Wow. That's that's Jacob Busa. Yeah. Yeah. So. Would you mind? Uh, do any have any questions for him while you're here? You got him on the spot. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want to dismiss us in prayer, brother? Okay. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for an encouraging evening together as believers looking into your word and how clear it is and how strong. Thank you for our brother Jim that's taught us and Lord reminded us of the importance of detail and thank you for your saving grace and that you keep us and hold us. Lord, uh, help us not to forget these things and uh, thank you for the privilege of knowing you and just being in the family of God that we can travel in many places and have a great class like this to come to. So thank you for the encouragement. I ask that you'll uh, continue to encourage Jim as he prepares and that there will be others that will continue to learn and grow. And uh, Lord, it's because of your love and forgiveness for us that we're here. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. All right. By the way, Jacob Busa was the most greatest hero in the South Pacific. What was the greatest hero in in the uh, in Europe?